Thank you for joining us. You are a part of an elite group who recognizes that black women's health should be at the forefront of the national conversation. We are mothers, daughters, activists, entrepreneurs, entertainers, corporate warriors, and more, who help boost the economy and often drive the national conversation. For 38 years, the Black Women's Health Imperative has strived to amplify our voices, help enact policy that protects us, research our issues, create programs that enhance our lives, and produce events like this one to ensure we keep the conversation going about the issues that matter to us most. So, let's get started with our program. Hi everyone, happy Tuesday. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Alana. I'm the Special Projects Manager for Black Women's Health Imperative and I am so excited about our conversation today. To give you a little background on us, Black Women's Health Imperative is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing health equity and social justice for Black women and girls through policy, advocacy, education, research, and leadership development. We identify the most pressing health issues that affect the nation's 22 million Black women and girls and invest in the best of the best strategies and organizations that accomplish our goals. Black Women's Health Imperative aims to educate this audience on the key climate aspects of the Build Back Better Act and the negative impact of climate change on Black communities. On October 28th, Joe Biden released a White House statement declaring that the Build Back Better Act framework will include the largest effort to combat climate change in American history. The investment will cut greenhouse gas pollution, reduce consumer energy costs, decrease air and water pollution, create hundreds of high quality jobs, and advance environmental justice by investing in a clean energy economy. As you may know, Black people are disproportionately affected by the harrowing effects of climate change. Air and water pollution, heat islands, and food apartheid are just a few of the many consequences communities of color are forced to endure. The negative health impacts due to climate change and environmental injustice severely impact the quality of life of citizens nationwide. Increased sensitivity to climate change is caused by a variety of social and biological factors. A few root causes are racial segregation, poverty, income inequality, lack of living wages, educational gaps, and neighborhood disinvestment. The inability to afford necessities such as affordable quality housing, reliable transportation, and affordable health care combined with biological factors like age and overall health status directly correlates with climate sensitivity. This afternoon, we are gathering panelists and participants to share their thoughts on how the recent passing of the Build Back Better Act may affect Virginia residents, what this means for their communities, and the necessary steps that need to be taken against the root issues I mentioned to ensure a stable, a sustainable future. I want to thank everyone participating in this conversation and the audience for being part of such an important conversation. We will also be hosting the A Climate Worth Building Twitter chat this Friday the 19th at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time from the Black Women's Health Imperative Twitter account to further discuss the information shared today. We would love your participation there as well. It is my pleasure to introduce Adriana Hopkins, our moderator. Adriana Hopkins is an anchor and reporter based in Washington, DC. Her career has taken her to Louisiana, Florida, Kentucky, and Georgia. She earned a bachelor's in electronic communications and African-American studies from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She and her husband have two beautiful and smart children. Adriana is passionate and she's an advocate for women's health issues, connecting with organizations that share a desire to find solutions to disparities in health outcomes for Black and BIPOC people. Equity is a persistent theme in her reporting as she explores topics ranging from environmental justice to the epidemic of gun violence to maternal to mortality outcomes. She firmly believes in connecting people to experiences outside of their own. So without further ado, Adriana. Alana, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And I wanna say good afternoon to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us to discuss this very important issue of climate change, its impact on communities in Virginia, and of course, environmental justice. Now we do have quite the lineup for you today. We have Sam Wojcicki, the legislative director for Congresswoman Abigail Spanberger of Virginia's seventh district. Now he covers policy issues related to climate, 
Environment, Energy, and Agriculture. We also have Miriam Kara, the Assistant Secretary of Natural and Historic Resources. She works on environmental justice, land conservation, historic preservation, wildlife and outdoor recreation, historic justice, and the Chesapeake Bay restoration in Governor Northam's office. We also have this afternoon, Dr. Doris Brown. She is the CEO and president of Brown & Associates. That is a health consulting company that manages programs addressing national and global health disparities. As president of the National Medical Association, her program theme focused on a collaborative approach to health equity entitled The Urgency of Now, created a culture for health equity. We're also joined by Akinyela Abdullah, the interim dean of the School of Arts and Sciences at Virginia Union. She is also the director of the Center for STEM Diversity and associate professor of environmental science and ecology. She studies the intersection between food security, human health, and environmental pollution. Those are the focus of her research. So as you can see, this panel is of course very well versed on the obstacles we face and the solutions that we need to seek environmental justice in Virginia, as well as across the nation and ultimately globally. I want to take you all, uh, take a moment to ask you all to participate in this discussion with us. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can leave those in the chat via Facebook Live or on YouTube. We will address those questions at the end of the program. So first, let's welcome our first guest, Sam Wojcicki, again, the Legislative Director for Congresswoman Abigail Spanberger. Sam, welcome and thank you for your time this afternoon. Uh, let's first get to the most important question. Uh, where do we stand with the Build Back Better Act? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I first like to just say thank you to the Black Women's Health Imperative for having us uh, here today, have the office represented. Um, so the Build Back Better Act, as you know, I think we're all kind of eagerly awaiting, is, is coming up in the House hopefully this week. Uh, and we're really excited to get this over the finish line. We just passed the Infrastructure Investment uh, and Jobs Act here in the House and had that signed into law by the president. Uh, and that started a down payment on some climate uh, priorities that we had. But the Build Back Better Act uh, is you know, still being negotiated, but we think we're really close and it's going to need to move through the Senate. Um, but once we get that over the finish line, I, I'm confident we're going to do that soon in the House. Uh, we expect that it can move through the Senate, come back to the House one last time and then be signed into law by the president. But, you know, as, as was mentioned at the, at the top of this event, you know, this is the largest single investment in climate uh, ever made by Congress, $550 billion. Uh, and that's going to go a really long way across, uh, you know, a multitude of the economy through, you know, transportation investments, power sector investments, investments directly in, in you know, uh, environmental justice communities and ending environmental racism. So mm -hmm. you know, we're really excited about that. And, you know, my boss in particular is very excited about the natural climate solutions and really enlisting the help of farmers and foresters across the country uh, in solving the climate crisis. So uh, we're really excited and we're really optimistic that this is going to get over the finish line soon. It's my understanding that the two, the infrastructure bill and this Build Back Better Act kind of work hand in hand and you really need one for the other one to get the full potential that it deserves. You know, I think that a lot of times we talk about bills and laws and Congress and Senate and House, and there's a lot of language and sometimes a lot of pork in these bills. Can you kind of explain to people how this would directly impact their lives in an, a tangible way? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I want to start off by saying, you know, this bill taken in concert, a lot of the climate provisions, you know, they are really, they're both targeted and they're both big picture. And so I'll just start with the big picture and say, you know, we're looking at, you know, a potential to really decarbonize the power sector uh, in the next 10 to 15 years. And, and projections are showing that this bill would, you know, increase clean energy to as much as 70% by 2030. I mean, that's, that's an outstanding and I think something that just didn't seem possible in the last five years. Um, but the investments here are really, they touch all across kind of people's lived experience, right? Whether it's the ability to put uh, a solar panel on your roof, if you want to, the tax credit for that is going to be made refundable. So instead of having to wait until the end of the tax year and find out whether or not you have enough of a tax bill for the statute to matter, you're going to be able to apply directly to the IRS and get a refund uh, for that investment that you're choosing to make on your home. Uh, on top of that, you know, my boss has really been out there leading on some of the farmer provisions. We worked with Cory Booker on the Climate Stewardship Act, which is reflected in this bill. And 
you know, what that was was a framework for how to make a historic investment in our agricultural communities uh, with equity in mind and really making sure that we're making investments in black and brown farmers who have been historically disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as we're doing that, making sure that they have access to funds to help with the work that they're already doing to help sequester carbon while raising their bottom line and raising the, you know, the quality of their crops. So, mm -hmm. you know, there are, there are these very specific and i could keep going i mean one other area that we're really excited about is the urban forestry provisions right we talk about heat islands especially you know we see this in richmond a lot and you know i grew up in the area and i i know that they're just there are areas without tree cover and you know disproportionately unfortunately these are in black and brown communities and so you know this bill looks to not only invest in urban forestry but to make sure that those urban forestry investments are made equitably and across the city and in all places so that's you know, we're, we are really excited about this, but I also just zoom back from the climate piece for a minute to say this is a massive investment yeah. in child care, the availability yes. of child care, expanding the child tax credit so that folks always have access to that moving forward. And we, you know, we end child poverty as much as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, investment in school lunch programs, uh, universal pre-K. I mean, this is about the health of our population and the, the well-being of our kids. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think it's just a really fantastic opportunity here. And, it, you know, I think folks are really going to feel this in a very, very concrete way once we get this passed. And so we're really excited for that. Certainly a completely different attitude toward the climate and climate change and environmental justice than the prior administration. I want to ask kind of a two-part question. How discouraged was your office and Congresswoman Spanberger's office for the last uh, four years? And how encouraged are you under the Biden administration? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I mean, I think we've always had optimism because we are seeing, you know, for the first time here, uh, you know, I, we talk about environmental justice, for instance. I mean, we're really turning the corner uh, we think on kind of the marriage of the environmental justice movement with the kind of traditional environmental climate movement. You know, for a long time, these things were actually in Congress kind of oppositionally opposed. And I think the last four years had this unifying opportunity here. And part of that is, I think folks realized we have to work together to get outcomes for people and that we want the same things here. Uh, but that also, you know, we are seeing some real changes that are happening as a result of the innovation that you know the Obama administration, quite frankly, and the Clinton administration before that, that you're really invested in. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, for instance, you know, solar and wind are winning in the energy markets because they're cheaper. They don't have fuel costs, and the technology costs have fallen to the point that, you know, I, in my role, I talk to coal folks. They can't compete. They can't get financing. So, you know, there's a lot of this message out there that's, oh, climate regulation is killing coal or climate. It's not. It's the economy. And that is making it so much easier for us to sell the message back home of these, this, you know, these investments mean jobs. And this is where the economy wants to go. It's where businesses want to go. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to fight that two front war anymore. Yeah. This is really about doing what makes sense. You know, uh, you know, we often say you don't have to want to do this for the environment necessarily. You have to want to do this because you want the economy to work. You know, right. Clean energy is cheap energy. And so the real you know, focus now is making sure that we make those investments in an equitable way and make sure they get to all communities. Right. Um, the equitable way and also the messaging. I think you hit the nail on the head. Oftentimes the messaging is just so um, not really understood and not relayed very well. Uh, I do want to ask you, what challenges do you currently face in your district regarding environmental justice and how have you been addressing those issues? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, one thing that I think that we've seen, you know, I mentioned the urban heat issue, that that is something that we we are concerned about. Um, but, you know, we've seen, you know, PFAS is something that continues to be um, you know, and, and for those who don't know, this is a, a forever chemical that unfortunately was used in everything from from uh, firefighting foam used on, on military bases and uh, airplanes or uh, airports rather. Uh, but also, you know, has been used in your cooking pans. And I mean, it, it really proliferated everywhere. Uh, and so we've seen some of that contamination. Um, and, you know, we were really excited. We've also seen lead pipe issues. And those are two areas that actually the bipartisan infrastructure investment and jobs act 
started to invest in. And now we're seeing the Build Back Better Act kind of come in with that second, you know, you mentioned these two things working in concert, mm -hmm. right? So that, that second wave of investment uh, to directly help us replace our water systems that have been contaminated and remove those contaminate, uh, contaminants in the case of PFAS and lead, get rid of those lead pipes. You know, mm -hmm. these are really concerning. It's concerning that we hear about schools in the Richmond area that, you know, have lead pipes still, lead service pipes. And well, you know, we've done a lot to mitigate the direct impacts on the drinking water. You know, we really need to get those pipes out of the ground mm -hmm. and replaced. And these two bills in concert make those investments. Um, and of course, those are just, you know, very discrete issues. But as was mentioned at the top of this event, you know, climate is kind of the ultimate environmental justice story, right? Uh, the kind of we talk about climate redlining, right? It is happening over time. We're seeing our financial systems invest in ways that are, you know, burdening both the government mm -hmm. and certain communities with mm -hmm. the impacts of climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, these bills really help us invest in you know, by investing in clean energy, we're investing in reducing uh, air pollution across all communities. Mm -hmm. And the best part about this bill is that, you know, systematically, when you go line by line, there was a, a real uh, focus on making sure equitably that these these funds are going to be used in an equitable manner. Uh, and so, for instance, there's a climate accelerator uh, it's kind of a supporter for green banks across the nation. And it makes sure that at least, you know, 40% of all investments that pass through that, that, you know, multi-billion dollar fund are going to go to communities that have been disproportionately impacted. Um, we were really excited to see this, this bill kind of advance on what the American Rescue Plan did for Justice for Black Farmers, mm -hmm. who have historically not had access to the same programs that white farmers have had, you know, across the last century mm -hmm. uh, plus. I mean, and that is, you know, a, hor a horrible backstory, but there's a real exciting opportunity here mm -hmm. for us to correct and start to move in the right direction. Uh, and, you know, it's not lost on us that also those tend to be the farms and the, the farmers that don't have the investments in resiliency to combat some of the climate issues that we've, we've already seen. You know, and part of the story we try to tell here is, that, you know, my boss is really passionate about is it's not just a, you know, we often tell the climate story kind of in the rural, uh, in the urban and suburban yeah. context, but it's yeah. also a rural story. Yeah. Uh, and there are a lot of impacts that we're seeing there as well. Absolutely. Last question for you. Uh, you know, you all are working on the federal level uh, at the U.S. Capitol. What would you like to see Virginians do on the local level? Yeah, I, you know, I think the, the big thing here is the more folks are talking about these issues and the more they are making their voices heard, the better. You know, there are so many issues that when we talk about, you know, uh, what Washington's going to do, they rise to the top and climate sometimes gets buried. And I think if folks really care about this and understand that it touches healthcare, right? Uh, it touches, uh, you know, pretty much it touches the economy. It's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, the cost of inaction on climate change is astronomical. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the opportunity of taking action in terms of jobs and in terms of economic growth is, is tremendous. And so, you know, we need folks on the ground to be talking about this and making sure that every you know level of government is hearing about it from you. Mm -hmm. And that can be at your school board and at your board of supervisors and how they're choosing to spend funds that they're getting from the federal government through the Build Back Better Act and the American Rescue Plan, but all the way up to our office. I mean, when we hear from constituents, it helps shape uh, you know, the actions that my boss take takes and, you know, our door is always open and we always want to hear from Virginians on these issues. So, you know, that is what I would say is it, it's just keeping that drumbeat, making sure people are hearing about it and recognizing that you, know, you have a tremendous, uh, you know, you can have tremendous impact with your voice. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, we say we get the government we deserve and, and it really is kind of true, you know, what you all tell us is what we then try to put into action because, you know, we're here to serve you. So I would just... I would emphasize that to anyone listening today is, you know, please get out there and be talking about these issues because they're really important. I would agree. All right, Sam, thank you for the wonderful discussion. Um, let's bring in now Miriam Karad. She is the Assistant Secretary of Natural and Historic Resources in Governor Ralph Northam's office. And for those who are not familiar, Miriam, can you kind of explain what you do in that position? 
Sure, absolutely. Thank you so much. And I do want to start off by thanking our hosts and thanking the Black Women's Health Imperative for this very important conversation. As mentioned, I have the privilege of serving as the Assistant Secretary of Natural and Historic Resources for Governor Northam. The last four years, I've served as the governor's advisor on environmental justice, environmental justice and the staff liaison to the Virginia Council on Environmental Justice. Much of this work um, is, invest, is investing in our communities and protecting our natural and historic resources. Much of what we are working through is an interagency and intergovernment and a whole government approach to protecting our natural and res natural resources, um, ensuring that our water quality and our air quality are best serving the constituents and the people of the Commonwealth. So let's talk about the main climate issues that Governor Northam's office focuses on regarding, you know, clean air, clean water, and clean energy. Uh, and can you explain how those issues affect Virginians? Absolutely. So when we talk about environmental justice, as we talk about water quality and air quality, I think it's important to understand that it is both a movement and legal definitions we're talking about. America's pressing social Challenges like affordable health care, housing, wage equity, to just name a few, are linked to our nation's continued legacy of systematic inequity and racial discrimination against Black and Brown Americans. Mm -hmm. I think it's important when we talk about water and air quality that we understand that these are also social challenges. Mm -hmm. And though it is not widely widely visible or understood, it is important to understand that um, our our underserved populations are also affected in a great in a great manner here. Mm -hmm. I think as we talk about environmental justice, I think it's important to note that Black women nationwide have boldly led um, a growing effort to heighten public awareness about and um, understanding how environmental issues like pollution and climate change both affect people of color as well as um, an ability to galvanize the push towards ensuring that clean air and clean water is a right for these communities. I think we'll talk a little bit and as mentioned by um, our, uh, the former, um, by Sam earlier, that the, uh, it, when we talk about environmental justice, we're really talking about the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, nation of origin, income, and with respect to development, implementation, enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies, as defined by the Environmental Protection Agency. And, and again, like the civil rights movement uh, movements of the 1950s and 60s, the environmental justice movement began as a grassroots level of movement. And when we began to see in the 80s, um, small groups of black men and women, as well as people of color, protesting hazardous waste centers in their communities and how um, it, it, uh, catalyzed, it is a catalyst for the environmental justice movement and the way in which uh, it affects people's livelihoods. It's important to note that that is at the very root, the um, issues that we're dealing here, with here. In Virginia, we're leading the way for um, the South as well as the country on some of these issues um, because it is so important to note that um, when we're talking about toxic waste, toxic waste facilities, water quality, whether it's the health of the Chesapeake Bay mm -hmm. um, or land conservation and a movement to um, ensure that our agriculture uses and um, implementation are best serving all of Virginians, it's important to note that um, it, it has historically and continues to disproportionately affect uh, our black and brown communities. You know, you bring up a lot of good points there, and I do want to just reiterate what you're saying and give some statistics. Uh, African Americans contribute 23% less to climate change, but bear 21% more of the harms when compared to other groups. Uh, you know, according to the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, women with asthma may be particularly susceptible to adverse outcomes such as preterm birth 
and stillbirth in association with air pollution uh, and exposure during gestation. Uh, we also know that pregnant women exposed to high temperatures of air pollution will likely have children who are premature, underweight, or stillborn, and African-American mothers and babies are harmed at a much higher rate than the population at large. Uh, you know, Miriam, these are a lot of statistics that I think some people would say, you know, how can you prove this? How can you say this? You can't tell me that air and pollution is racist. Are you finding that this is becoming a more widespread fact for people? Or how is your office able to kind of address maybe the hesitancy or those who don't agree with or don't believe this aspect of climate change? Thank you. And, you know, those are great um, points to make, and also it is in our in the very lived experience that we have. We continue to hear from that I know historically um, has not been heard. Think on the deeper emotional and historic tie between um, the land, air, and water, and both um, Black Americans, Native Americans, and um, our communities that have traditionally been underserved and underrepresented are at the core of this very uh, crust an important mo uh, moment in our history. I think that um, the governor uh, two years ago had an initiative around black maternal health. And it is a very clear connection that climate change as well as our environment is a threat to everyone's physical health, mental health, air, water, food, shelter, mm -hmm. um, and so on. But socially, socially, socially and economically disadvantaged communities like the ones we're talking about today face the greater risk and mm -hmm. have for centuries. I think it's important that we listen to the lived experience. One of the things that we have been able to do um, through the codification of the Virginia Council on Environmental Justice, as well as um, a governor's initiative around the interagency working group uh, focused on environmental justice to look at a whole government approach to whether it's health and human resources or we're talking about um, environmental agencies that uh, transportation that we start to link these ties mm -hmm. and it really is about having that conversation um, the fact of the matter is that um, these these communities will suffer the worst of the impacts mm -hmm. while um, contributing the least um, mm -hmm. as you mentioned think unless we recognize that fighting climate change and environmental change uh, environmental justice are inextricably linked mm -hmm. that we don't move everyone in the right direction and i think we we continue to we continue to find that it's important to have a seat at the table to have mm -hmm. these advisory groups that speak to um this important uh important intersection but more importantly i think that as we have initiatives around um so for instance uh virginia last year um signed in, the governor signed into law the virginia clean economy act um, making Virginia one of the very few first uh, Southern, uh, the very first state and um, one of the very few states to adopt a 100% clean electricity standard into law. Mm -hmm. It's important to draw in those um, that lens of equity and um, and put that into law, making sure that we are um, not only uh, carving out a uh, a portion of the um the conversation about these communities but also ensuring that our most vulnerable communities have a seat at the table um at least 25 percent of the proceeds from uh our uh our, our regional greenhouse gas initiative uh um that we well the uh the provisions that we put into that um are going to our vulnerable communities and that um again is a for those who don't know, is um, an initiative that puts a cap on our carbon pollution from power plants. And um, as we raise those proceeds, we want to invest in energy efficiency and climate resilience for those um, communities and specifically write that into law, which we have done. Um, we've received about $43 million in carbon um, market revenue up to this point. And a a port to an, at least, and again, at least 25% is earmarked for um, energy efficiency for uh, for these communities. I think not only do we acknowledge that climate change and its consequences are very much linked to race yeah. um, in our in, um, instances here, but also make the best available science, like some of the uh, the the some of the very important numbers that need to come out of that to ensure that we enhance social equity. And as we work through our protective 
um, efforts to whether it's coastal adaptation, resilience, and so on, that we look at those social factors and um, ensure that we have uh, both our, whether it's an, our HPCUs involved right. in our conversation or our very um, important experts also reflect the very people that we're serving. Yes, as you said, bringing everyone to the table and giving everyone a seat for their input, because that input is equally as important as the next person's. Miriam, thank you so much. Um, I do want to speak next with Dr. Doris Brown. And Dr. Brown, it's great to have you here with us this afternoon. You know, reading your biography, it is very clear that you are attacking health disparities and inequities on several fronts. Uh, first, let's discuss how you are working to strengthen health equity. Thank you so much, first for the organizers and for your wonderful introduction. Um, as a representative from the National Medical Association, um, I serve as a co-chair of the Environmental Health uh, Commission. Um, I also am representing the organization for the National Academy of Medicine at its um, program that's decarbonizing the health effects. So let me just give you a little bit about so many of the things that I have been doing since leaving um, the presidency of the National Medical Association. And I think most people understand that the National Medical Association, or NMA, is the oldest healthcare provider organization representing minority physicians. Um, and, and we focus on our programs through education, advocacy, health policy, and we really want to promote health and wellness and sustaining physician viability. And that leads us to a key part of our platform, which really is about health equity. And health equity is a state in which everyone has the opportunity to attain their full health potential without being disadvantaged based upon their social status or social position. And so when we look at the health inequities that are faced by uh, BIPOC communities. It's really different from health disparities because the inequities are rooted in our unjust and unfair system. Mm -hmm. And so if in order for us to achieve health inequity, it really means that we as a society must work together to achieve the highest health potential for everyone. And so the reasons for these inequities are so numerous and complex, but mm -hmm. we have to focus on some of the primary variables, race, which mm -hmm. most cases we don't want to talk about, poverty, and gender. And those conditions also include access to health care, mm -hmm. the affordability of health care, cultural behaviors and beliefs, and I will add another one, the limited access to participation in clinical research so we can really know what is going on. And most of those things are really embedded in the social determinants of health that are truly responsible. And it is the unfair, avoidable differences in our health mm -hmm. status that really we see all the time. And when you couple that with the racist society that we're living in today, where uh, it determines the course of our lives mm -hmm. and the nature of our relationships. So we can't get away from, and I think now after the George Floyd uh, incidents and Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. we have moved to recognizing that racism is really pervasive in our mm -hmm. American society, and it is a strong, silent determinant of health, wealth, mm -hmm and general welfare. And so in medicine, we struggle with how can we advance health equity? How can we um, minimize those racist beliefs and biases mm -hmm. that we see in our profession? How can we reform our health systems and structures so that we can get away from the structures that racism have created, mm -hmm. perpetuated, and exacerbated and leading to the health equities? And I believe that in order to uh, achieve that health equity, it means that we have to work in a collaborative manner, mm -hmm. working together, and it takes all sectors of society to bring that about. 
I would absolutely agree with you. You bring up so many points between George Floyd's murder and COVID. You know, COVID really shed a light on all of the disparities and lack of access to whether it's COVID tests, now COVID vaccines. So it's all kind of bubbling to the surface. That leads me to my next question. Uh, Two-part question. Do you believe that our current leaders are equipped to tackle this huge mountain. I mean, this is something that's been built up over centuries, these health inequities that lead to health disparities. And also, what's your take on this Build Back Better Act? Do you think that this promise of uh, equitable society is actually achievable? Yes, it is. But as I've indicated, it's going to take a joint collaborative effort with all of us working together. There are some major components in the Build Back Better uh, Act that really can help us to combat some of the uh, changes, particularly the climate changes, uh, the impact on the Affordable Care Act. And, and again, while it is complex, doesn't mean that we should say, I can't deal with that. It means that we have to work together. The, the agriculture department has to work with the transportation department, the, the interior department, the health sector, mm -hmm. um, uh, all of these, because those social determinants mm -hmm. really encompass all of those things mm -hmm. and they are inextricably tied to climate health. Uh, when you think about the chronic diseases that has a more devastating impact on people of color, the heart disease, the diabetes, the cancer, the asthma, uh, uh, even Alzheimer's, all mm -hmm. of those have a line that's running through climate change. And we must address that if we are going to work to bring about changes. And so again, um, the Build Back Better Act and the climate, and I'm so thankful for the infrastructure bill passing mm -hmm. because that gives us an opportunity to begin to address uh, uh, the clean water uh, uh, and other issues that's going on in our community. Now, I know in your profession and amongst you and your colleagues, I'm sure that a long time ago, you all made the connection between climate and health. Do you feel like are you encouraged by people really taking hold of this now and saying, yes, we have a lot of issues and climate is a major factor that we need to address? Do you think we have finally reached this moment in time? Yes, I think we're beginning to see because now we're getting um, the medical consortium, medical society consortium of, of uh, climate and health. And we're beginning to look at those components and addressing them every day. And one of the things that I found at the past few days was very important um, is that we develop guidelines in healthcare. And many times when we look at the social determinants of health, many years ago, you know, it's like, you know, we're dealing with health as it's a standalone. We don't care about where you live and work and play. That has no impact on your health outcomes. But we're beginning to see that. And even the U.S. task force, a uh, public health task force, has begin, begun to address the social determinants of health and looking at it in a scientific manner. Yeah. And I think that is really key when we are talking about how can we overcome this? And now we have to look at the structural racism that's mm -hmm. also part of that, if we're really going to come out of it. But we are looking at a change. It's slow, but it is getting there. And again, uh, very important. And I think that when you start to implement the components of the Build Back Better communities, we can address all of those opportunities that are tied into the social determinants of health. Okay, last question for you, and I'll have to keep this brief. Um, do you find, because you mentioned that there's some cultural aspects to our health uh, disparities and inequities, do you find that Black people, Brown people are getting on board with, you know, we want cleaner air, we need non-lead pipes, we need you to address this issue in our communities where we have felt the brunt of it for a long time? Yes, uh, we're getting a lot of young voices that's really taking this on. And they mm -hmm. are saying that this has to change. We have mm -hmm. to get rules. There's a, 
um, uh, a group called the Hip Hop Hip Hop Coalition, and I think they are addressing some of those environmental things that really must come to pass. And I think it's really good because we know from the scientific standpoint, and I would just use um, COVID as an example. You, many people have not thought that COVID is tied to climate change, the pollution, the, the, the poor air. But when you have a respiratory condition and you're living in an area where you are exposed to pollutants, you are going to have a more devastating outcome of your exposure to COVID. And I think the other important piece is that we have to get away from the misinformation and the disinformation that's not rooted in science if we are going to really move forward in addressing those conditions. Absolutely. Dr. Brown, a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks. Let's talk now with Interim Dean Akinyela Cobb Abdullah. Tell us so, thank you so much for being here this afternoon. Uh, begin, please, by telling us about your work uh, that you're doing at Virginia Union and your personal thoughts on environmental justice and climate inequity. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm very, very grateful to have been invited by the Black women's health imperative to participate in this panel discussion. Thank you, Adriana, for being the hostess with the Moses. So um, <laughs> let me get into what it is that I do. I, I, as you said, I'm the interim dean of the School of Arts and Sciences at the Virginia Union University, which is located in Richmond. It is the historically black college university located right there in Richmond, not too far away from the other university. Um, <laughs> And uh, I have enjoyed five years of working as a, a initially an associate professor of environmental science and ecology. Um, and uh, subsequently after that, I began to serve at, at the same time as the director for the um, Center for STEM Diversity. Mm -hmm. And so through my work, I have been able to uh, teach classes. Uh, I teach the environmental science class, which I am happy to say is a general education course, which means that most of our students on campus can choose that as their science elective. And so I've had a lot of students come through my class and I am not the only person teaching that class. Thank goodness, there are other people who teach it so we get to offer more sections, but it gives us an opportunity to share the um, information that students need to know about the environment. And we get an opportunity to teach them that they are actually a part of the environment, not something separate. Um, a lot of times people feel like the environment is something that tree huggers are into mm -hmm. or people who like to do climbing or you know they're interested in conservation only um, but environmental science is so much more than that um, i also teach the ecology class and it's so funny uh, when i teach both classes um, i have students who may be enrolled in both classes and they say to me a lot of times dr abdullah i then we talk about that in one of the other classes and i say yes we do because um, environmental science is interdisciplinary. And this is another reason why I like to teach this course because I get to touch all of the majors and let them know that everything that they're doing in their career is just as important as the sciences for environmental science. All areas of society, all persons are responsible for how we as humans impact the environment. And we need to be thinking in our work, how is my work impacting our natural spaces, which ultimately humans depend on. And if we're negatively impacting our natural spaces, then that's ultimately gonna have a negative impact on us. So teaching the students that they are a part of the environment, along with teaching the science, you know, what is matter, what, um, how, how, does, how does matter interact? What is chemistry? You know, how is all of that related? Um, you know, how are, uh, the chemicals that we use from the food that we consume to the commodities that we uh, that are manufactured that we use from their cell phones to their hair care products yeah. to their waste products how how is all of this having an impact on the natural spaces which as i said before are we all depend on um so i really really have enjoyed uh, working with the students and having an opportunity to teach these things and make them raise their awareness we're in the business of raising awareness and encouraging students to find their voice and make their impact on issues that that they are passionate about for the whole of everyone 
Yeah. Right. And I really like how you're breaking that down. We are all part of the environment and you're giving them really tangible ways to show how they're a part of it and contributing it to it negatively or positively. And of course, planting that seed in these formative years so that they take this with them throughout their lives. Yes. You know, you are there in Richmond, which does have its own uh, climate inequities uh, and disparities because of that. How are, are you and the school and students really impacting that community and getting out and kind of spreading awareness, like you say, is so important? OK, well, we have uh, so we engage in partnerships with um, people in the community. Uh, my initial work. Uh, my research area is dealing with urban garden and urban garden products and the impact of um, air pollution mm -hmm. on the quality of those products. So I have engaged with organizations like Renew Richmond. Um, actually, I had a connect of a very, very active person. His name is Duran Chavis. He is everywhere talking about redlining, talking about food security. Um, he's out building urban garden plots for people. I mean, he's doing a lot. So he is my community connect. Um, he took some of our students out to some of the gardens and, you know, teach them how to cultivate plants. And um, also, you know, urban gardening is a very important strategy that people can use who live in food deserts. Mm -hmm. And so the students get an opportunity to learn what a food desert is and how you can feel empowered by growing your own food. Mm -hmm. And uh, in addition to you growing it, you know what, what products you use to cultivate it. You know what the quality of the soil is that you're using. Um, the only thing you're not in control of is the atmosphere <laughs> because, mm -hmm. you know, we're usually in urban settings, we have a lot of air pollutants from mm -hmm. industry and from transportation. And those types of things can um, influence the quality of the food that you're producing. So that's one way that we're um, educating our students and giving them that hands on experience mm -hmm. with something as important as food security. Um, in addition to that, we're working with um, another organization called Virginia Interfaith Power and Light, and they're very active with keeping up with uh, legislation. Um, uh, they're the pipelines uh, that Dominion wants to put in certain areas, they're on top of it. So we share that information with our students. And we also uh, work with the environmental, the RVA Environmental Film Festival, mm -hmm. where um, we are a host. So we show one of the films during the festival so that the students can, you know, they don't have to go far. And with COVID, everybody can attend. But before we hosting it on our campus was uh, made it convenient for the students. Um, we collaborate with the city of Richmond Health Department. Um, we're actually engaged in a, a project on uh, COVID with the Gilpin Court uh, community. Um, so we do a lot. Uh, we even host Earth Day celebrations on our campus. Um, one of the most exciting um, events we had before COVID is we brought uh, electric vehicles to the campus so the students can actually see them up close and get in them and things like that. And it really piqued their interest. They really liked it. We also invite other community organizations that support environmental justice and environmental issues to our campus to share information with the students. So um, we reach out and the community comes in and, uh, you know, students are also involved in advocacy. Uh, we had recently, just last, maybe, was it earlier this week, we had a, uh, some of the delegates, we, we had a panel, we have a delegate on our campus who is a visiting professor, and we had a chance to question the delegates about their, um, the policies and bills that they support uh, related to environmental uh, science, environmental justice, and um, those types of uh, topics. And so the students had a first, you know, they had access to the legislators to mm -hmm. find out, you know, what their positions are. You know, Virginia Union University has a history of social activism. Mm -hmm. um, we had, um, we were at the forefront of the um, movement to desegregate uh, facilities in Richmond. So our students are primed and ready to get out there and use their voices for change. And we encourage them every step of the way. That is so encouraging to hear. Uh, last question for you, and I'll keep it brief so that we don't run out of time here. Uh, but what would you like to see change in the community surrounding your school? You know, um, this Build Back Better Act, I'm excited about it. Um, I'm excited about Governor Northam's um, 
bills that he he was able to pass for, for about clean uh, energy. But um, I am a little discouraged because now we have a new gov we have a, an incoming governor, and I don't believe that they share uh, the same you know um, ideas about energy. So I'm I'm hopeful that you know maybe the uh, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm I'm going to keep praying about it, and we'll keep using our voices. But I'll just tell you, our campus is located near historic Jackson Ward, and that community, like a lot of other communities um, in the United States, um, was the sites or the area which the highway was built mm -hmm. through. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, as I mentioned before, we, we're not in control of the atmosphere in, in our neighborhoods. And the highway running through a historically Black neighborhood is a serious environmental justice issue. And I know we're not going to move the highway, but I'm thinking that this act could stem or, or, or help with some type of innovation to reduce mm -hmm. the pollution in that com in the community. Um, it's not in that community. Our school is actually sitting right next to the um, to the expressway. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, I, I like it for the fact that we can do research so that we'll have actual data to show mm -hmm. that this is actually a negative experience that we're having. But um, I'm hoping that we can probably benefit from some of these money so that, you know, to support research and mm -hmm. also to, to support innovation to reduce the air pollution, um, not only air pollution and any other type of pollution that we're experiencing over in the area around our school. So. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Cobb Abdullah. Don't go anywhere. I do want to take time now to bring back all of our panelists for a few more questions before we end this session. I want to start uh, with Miriam. We do have a question uh, regarding the recent gubernatorial race, of course, leading to a change of Virginia's administration, specifically from you know Governor Northam, a Democrat who acknowledged climate change and climate as a problem. Uh, pro Problem, to now Governor-elect Glenn Youngkin, who has different ideology about it. How would you say this is going to impact climate policies and legislation in the coming years? Thank you for that question. I share the sentiments and concern about how we will be moving forward. The great thing about having some of um, having passed some of the bills that we have in over the past few years is that we've codified a lot of stuff. Now, what that means is we're going to need a lot of support and continued advocacy at all levels of uh, both federal and local government to make sure that we keep pushing these forward. Um, I, I'd, I'd urge every Virginian and anybody who's concerned about um, the future of Virginia to uh, ask legislators to hold them responsible for, um, I think, our environment and ensuring that we're looking and we're continuing to look at this through an equity lens. I think we need to protect a lot of the legislative uh, progress we've made, um, ensuring that now that we've lost uh, a few seats from the Democratic side, um, uh, in the House of Delegates to ensure that you, these folks are truly representing the best interest of all of Virginians. Um, the Virginia Clean Economy Act was just a huge step forward. Continuing to invest in our most vulnerable communities is really important. I think it's been mentioned by um, my fellow panelists that there, this is an opportunity to really hold um, the feet to the fire. I know a lot of us who may be leaving the the administration will certainly keep to keep fighting um, interfaith power and light and some of the groups that have been mentioned today are great advocates some of them serve on the um the virginia council on environmental justice uh we need to make sure we keep an eye out on our health and human resources uh, initiatives ensuring that um as we push forward um whether it's black maternal health or other um intersections of our health and, um, and it, climate impact that we keep pushing forward on these things. I think paying attention is the most important part and uh, rest assured that we will continue fighting and we will continue to move forward. Again, I think we've created some created some seats at the table and we hope that that will serve as well on both advisory boards um, across state government and folks that will be good uh, advocates for this work. 
Miriam, thank you. Sam, you know, Congresswoman Spanberger's office is tapped into the agricultural and rural parts of this state. Uh, can you kind of explain to people how climate change directly impacts farm and then impacts our food? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I'll, I'll start off by saying something that my boss is very fond of saying, which is that you know, food security is national security, right? And so she had a career in the CIA and, you know, she's seen this across the world and, and it's something that we are very concerned about when we talk about the impacts of climate change. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in terms of the climate crisis impacting our farms, I mean, we already hear this from farmers across the 7th District, across Central Virginia, uh, you know, pests that previously had not been an issue, whether this mm -hmm. is diseases and blights, or this is, you know, insects, are now their range is changing as the temperature is changing. And we're seeing that in real time in Virginia. And that changes when you have to apply pesticides, what kind of pesticides you're applying, or what kind of natural techniques you're using to treat crops and keep them healthy. Um, this, you know, we've seen that the range of crops is changing. I used to uh, personally work in an office in, in for an Illinois member. And, uh, you know, we were hearing from, from state scientists there that by 2050, you may not be able to grow conventional strains of corn in Illinois anymore. I mean, think about that, Illinois not being able to grow corn. Uh, that's completely unheard of. And we're seeing the same thing start to take root in Virginia. Um, in addition to that, flooding and droughts, droughts are becoming longer and more severe. Floods are becoming more frequent. Uh, you know, Virginia uh, had in the last couple of years, we at one point were eligible for uh, disaster funds from USDA because of flooding in Chesterfield mm -hmm. and other counties uh, across our district. So we're seeing this. And, you know, so far we have been lucky. Uh, and, you know, in the United States, I mean, we have we're the kind of the breadbasket of the world. And so the, the luck that we've had is that at so far, none of these climate you know catastrophes have been coordinated enough to cause food shortages in the United States. But right now, I mean, the COVID crisis should be a wake up call for folks when it comes to supply chain disruptions and what they can mean. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if the U.S. is not able to export food, we're talking about real national security concerns in parts of the world that rely on our food supply uh, to keep stable. Um, so, you know, this is something that we really need to be paying attention to. It's something that you know, as the chair of conservation and forestry subcommittee on the U.S. Uh, Agriculture Committee in the House, uh, my boss is really tuned into. But it's it's a really concerning problem, and it's something that I think farmers are very well aware of. And we are starting to really bridge that conversation into our rural communities. Um, so you know, it, it's a good question, and something we really have to make investments in and make sure that we're we're keeping a close eye on. Absolutely. Dr. Brown, I want to ask you a question from the audience, and that is what can health care providers do to affect environmental and climate change on the community? Certainly. Yes. Thank you so much. There is so much that health care providers can do, not just um, in terms of speaking with their patient population, but within our health systems, hospitals, the amount of waste that goes into the environment from hospitals are tremendous. We haven't even looked at the, the use of um, PPEs that we put into the trash can, the plastics that we use in terms of things. So I think the system has to get a hold of, let us each start with small steps um, um, just taking operating rooms and some of the gases that are used there, changing that system, um, the amount of food that is wasted in mm -hmm. hospitals that's being served, that's another area. So mm -hmm. I think we have to look at our entire system, the packaging that's on medicines, uh, lots of plastic that's there. And many times we don't need all of those special things to get them to the community that needs it to look at that and to decide that we need to start making changes in terms of how it's packaged, how it's delivered. Um, and, and again, believing in composting. Um, so individuals within their homes um, and then within the community and then going on to the systems of making sure that we can all take a, a role in getting rid of of the devastating effects of climate change. I mean, we have seen 
more fire fires and, and more heat waves and flooding and hurricanes and tornadoes yeah. in places we haven't seen before. Yeah. And that's all due to the climate change. So we have to then say, I must be responsible. Look at mm -hmm. individually and then look at it from an organizational standpoint of steps that we can take. This is the only planet we have. We don't get it right. We don't get a second do-over. That is a very good point. Um, Akinyela, I wanna ask you a couple of questions to first piggyback after what uh, Dr. Brown explained in terms of organizing and getting involved. You know, I think that you at your school, you and your students are doing that. So if you could offer uh, some everyday ways that citizens can affect responses to uh, climate change, that's part one. And then also, uh, you know, what are the initiatives happening at HBCUs uh, to impact the local communities that they are based in and help black and brown people get on board and change their views of climate change? Okay, thank you for that question. Um, I want to go back to something that Mr. Wojcicki said earlier, and that is, and I think maybe the rest of our um, the panelists also mentioned this, we have to use our voices. We have to become civically engaged. Um, I think it was mentioned that the current administration will be leaving soon, but they will continue to be active and continue to hold the, our representatives uh, feet to the fire about the uh, promises that they made during their campaigns. And our students can be engaged, uh, everyday citizens can be engaged, and that is the only way that we can affect change. So that is my recommendation. Um, the other thing is think about how you are consuming. We are a nation of consumers, and um, you know they say that um, the consumer dictates the market. Well, if we don't purchase certain things, then people will stop making those things. Um, we live in a society full of convenience. Yeah. And so there are lots of things that we like. I just broke down and bought paper plates. I did. I will admit it. <laughs> I feel bad about it. <laughs> but um, it is paper. It's not the ones that have the wax and other plastic material on it. So I, I feel like I'm, you know, I've made a smarter choice. So just think about your personal behaviors and see how much you can reduce um, the things that are wasteful and, uh, you know, reduce your consumption. Um, as far as Virginia Union is concerned, we are actively involved in the community. Remember, we're in the business of raising awareness through education and empowering students so that they can go out and make an impact in the world. And so one of the ways that we do that um, is through parting, partnering with RPS um, to help educate teachers, STEM teachers in particular, um, or strategies that they can use to prepare students so that when we get them at Virginia Union, um, they will be prepared to continue their education and be more impactful in the STEM workforce. Um, we also offer uh, and partner with RPS to work with after school programs. Um, we're currently in the process of writing grants to work with the teachers and with the youth. So keep your eyes out. We offer scholarships to the students, our current president, offered a lot of students. I think we have students who will be coming uh, there. I think it's 25 of them who've been offered full, full scholarships. I, I think they were in middle school. So they're coming and we'll be prepared for them to get them ready to work in the STEM workforce. We are currently working in collaboration with the Richmond Health Department to help raise awareness, uh, of, to, to help raise COVID literacy in some of the communities so that people are um, reducing our exposure, reducing their exposure to, uh, to COVID. And uh, we're also working with the Science Museum to participate in the Heat Island um, data collection uh, pro project. So we try to get out there and do our part and we can do a whole lot more. As soon as COVID is over, we will open our campus back up to the fabulous uh, Earth Day celebration, which we plan for it to be bigger and better every year. So those are just some examples of some of the um, initiatives that Virginia Union is involved in. Yes, doing great work. Uh, Miriam, I wanna ask you, we have a question about how can small businesses help to curb climate change and reduce their carbon footprint? Thank you for the question. There are several things that you can do, as Dr. Cobb Abdullah mentioned. You're looking at your everyday use. I'm mm -hmm. encouraging, I think, both both your business as well as your business um, 
customers to um, engage in the importance of both uh, the need to reduce our our um, our waste as well as um, our social and very important responsibility to one another. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there are several different green groups that um, provide some resources, Green Virginia, on um, a lot of tourism um, uh, initiatives as well to uh, continue to push that forward. And I know my colleague Sam has um, great ideas there too. I think the one thing that I will mention is um, the governor did uh, issue an executive order recently um, around plastic single use for state government mm -hmm. to lead by example mm -hmm. and to try by 2035 to go 100% um, single pl plastic use free. Our um, our universities across the the uh, Commonwealth are also moving in a good direction. There, looking for alternative resources. Um, that replace single use plastics, starting small, and then um, also asking, I think, both of the government and letting us know that you need um, some uh, incentives or rather you need some uh, alternatives in creating a market for that. So I think if we all move towards that, um, we certainly will do that and um, notifying folks, whether it's at the local government, um, your uh, your um your folks that are providing these services that it's important for you to both as customers as well as um, educating one another. And I'll turn it over to Sam too. I think he has something to add. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, uh, those are all great points. And I would just say, you know, the other piece too is a small business getting involved with your chamber and trying to move mm -hmm. the chamber in that direction, right? Like you have a voice of advocacy as a leader in the, in the business community and in your local community and, and using that voice and explaining how, you know, taking action on climate change, being a part of the clean energy economy is beneficial to your business. Uh, and then taking that message into those groups that act as advocacy groups uh, on your behalf and making sure that they are reflecting the voice you want them to reflect with policymakers and with the community. And so, you know, we're, we're starting to see that movement because I think businesses are starting to recognize that this is this is good for their bottom line. But it takes, you know, their members pushing in that direction as well. I want to keep you on the mic, Sam, um, speaking of businesses kind of pushing for this and also recognizing that it's to the betterment of, of their business, their bottom line, as well as those who purchase things from them. We do have a question, and that is, I would like to know if biopharmaceutical companies are pushing for a necessary systemic and long term change to better meet the needs of black and brown America. Are you finding that these companies are really attaching themselves to climate change and, and environmental justice. You know, one, one great story we have in the Richmond area has been the development and really hand in hand with our local universities of uh, advanced pharmaceutical manufacturing. And part of what we've seen with this is, you know, the manufacturing that is now happening, you know, for years, first of all, I don't know if folks know this, in the United States, we don't actually have the capacity to produce uh, antibiotics anymore. Most of those are produced over overseas, which is a huge risk from a national security standpoint. And we're seeing supply chain disruptions now that are really bringing that to light. But the other part was the reason we stopped producing them here was because environmentally, it is very damaging to produce in the historic kind of ways that we used to produce these drugs. Uh, they have a lot of terrible impacts on the local environment in terms of dirty water and pollution and, and toxic solvents. The new pioneering way that Richmond is really on the cutting edge here uh, of, of manufacturing, we're actually seeing those uh, companies invest in manufacturing processes that don't use toxic solvents, that produce just as much drugs as we need, and that reduce the environmental input, uh, so or output rather. So what we're really seeing is, is Richmond, the companies in Richmond really are leading the way here. And, and they're doing it for, again, entirely, uh, I'll be honest, entirely selfish reasons, right? They're doing it because it's, it's good for their bottom line. But, um, you know, so often we're seeing these things go hand in hand. Uh, and, you know, we've been really um, excited to see our universities, the North administration, so many folks really help spur this investment in the Richmond area. Uh, and, you know, and it's offering a lot of really great jobs. And so, you know, I think that's that's one example. I think there's a lot more that companies can do. And you know, when we talk about personal responsibility on climate, uh, that's certainly, you know, I think being a consumer and, and putting your money where 
uh, where you see folks reflecting those priorities is important. But a lot of this is we really need our corporations and the government to step up to the plate and really take responsibility because that's over 75% of emissions right. come down to those two groups. Right. Uh, and so that's where we need to make the changes. Right. Dr. Brown, uh, this question is quite broad. Um, it is, how do I address health inequity? And, you know, I'll just say that I do kind of a lot of these events in terms of, you know, women's health and black maternal care. And we always say that you have to be your biggest advocate when it comes to seeking out your best outcome. So maybe that helps it narrow down a little bit, but how can people address health inequity? Yes, thank you so much for the question. And I'd like to just add a little bit to the comment that uh, Sam was making in terms of, of biopharmaceuticals uh, adding to that. The National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine has uh, an action collaborative on decarbonizing the health sector. And we're looking at it as a representative on one of the working groups. Um, we're looking at it from a policy standpoint, but from every sector. And we have not only the pharmaceutical industry, hospitals, um, medical schools, uh, uh, insurance uh, from a health standpoint are all represented on that. So they are beginning to address the issues of decarbonizing the health sector and making a, a cleaner environment for the future. And yes, it might impact their bottom line, but I think they realize that this is the only planet we have and we all have to make a step. And now getting to your question, um, Adriana, of how do we as an individual or you take on uh, the health equity challenge? And as I've indicated, very complex issue, but I think it means that each individual need to be a part of an organized effort um, that you want to have your voice heard. So you might have to mobilize your small group to take action, to write to your legislative representatives. Um, you want to feel empowered. And even if it is um, young children's groups starting off in the elementary or primary school level, but feeling that they are empowered, even if it's picking up uh, uh, some of the plastic that you see thrown around or saying that for the holidays, don't buy me this plastic toy. Uh, uh, you want to, again, at every level, feel like they are part of an organized, mobilized, empowered uh, a community, and then feel like you can amplify your voice by joining with others to make change. And little steps grow into big steps when we all start to make those changes. And so it's like, well, what do I do in my house? Rather than buying those 25 or whatever, 24 little bottles of water, I should buy a larger thing of water um, rather than um, uh, cooking with uh, charcoal. I should have a, a different system. So you, you want to look at um, and then getting into the industry of let me go to the market to buy fresh produce that's not already put into all of those plastic containers um, and going to, and I think most restaurants and, and have takeout because COVID has forced us into a takeout community, but most of the uh, areas require paper in terms of those takeout containers. Uh, we've gotten away from the plastic straws. Mm -hmm. Take your own straw. There's little metal ones you can use. You don't have to um, have those disposable things. Um, collecting rainwater to water your lawn. Um, and so it's little things that each of us as an individual can do and then getting your community, your group to spread that out. And if, as it continues to grow, I think we can make an impact. And by all means, making sure policies are generated to help you advance that by getting your legislative uh, community to take action. I'd like to just add one more thing. Dr. Brown makes some great points and especially about your everyday use. I think I'll also just put a plug into our boards and commissions across the Commonwealth. Um, 
are boards that make some regulations that support some of those efforts um, and uh, making your voice heard there too. And um, I will um, mention that I think that that is, you know, you can just do a quick Google of Commonwealth of Virginia boards and commissions. And that's everything from health boards that make um, decisions and regulations to environmental boards and natural resources boards. That's a great way to also make your voice heard and heard. And I'll say that we do our boards, we've done a great job over the last couple of years to try to better represent um, Virginia and um, who uh, who we are. And I think that we would absolutely love more voices in um have a better understanding of what uh, our constituents really need. May well, I, I, may I, I, just absolutely. To, I just wanted to uh, say that, you know, um, don't forget that you are part of community. Some people attend church. Some people are part of civic organizations, fraternities, and sororities. I know for me, it's a lot to keep up with, but I know through my sorority, they have um, actual legislative days where the uh, legislators actually come together and we can get some of them to share information with us about bills that we that are going to come up. And it's really, really helpful. So don't forget about your community. Speak up at church. You can show your leadership skills there or whatever civic organization you're in um, that uh, can organize because more voices together actually move you know, move the needle than just individuals, so. And I think as a final point, um, I certainly agree that we, we have to go through those organizations and having our legislative days, but we also need to do volunteerism, cleaning up the Chesapeake, cleaning up the Anacostia. Um, the, the, our water spaces have become so contaminated. So there is, and, and when um, you mentioned uh, sororities, I know that we have that day where you have um, a day, I don't know, January or February, where you give back to the community and you go to clean up a school or uh, clean up of uh, the parks. Uh, uh, again, things that really need to be done. So you're taking an active role in cleaning your community. Uh, I'll just, one last, sorry, one last thing I'll just hop in to say on the legislative days, absolutely. If, the best bills that we write here are bills that are informed from constituents and things that we hear are happening in the district. So when we hear from from you all, you know, it sets us off and starts thinking about, you know, how can we fix these particular issues? Because we all know the big issues. We know the, the climate you know, crisis is a big issue from, the, from the, the national, international scale. But there are concrete impacts and concrete changes that we can make in folks' lives in the district if we know that there are issues. And so that's you know, pick up the phone, call us, come into the office. Our door is always open. Wonderful. Well, Akinyela, Sam, Miriam, Doris, thank you so much for sharing your insight and your expertise with us this afternoon on such an important and impactful topic. It is greatly appreciated. Alana and the Black Women's Health Imperative, thank you so much for organizing this and coordinating it and sharing this information. You see there on the bottom of your screen, you can always get more information from the website www.bwhi.org. Also on Friday at noon on the Black Women's Health Imperative Twitter page, they are hosting a live Twitter chat. So there you have the Twitter handle there at BLK Women's Health. So be sure to tune in and participate. Thank you all so much for your time. Thank you all for joining us. Be well and take care. Thank you.